I'm Dr. Joe and I am to lovethatface.com and today we're going to talk about otoplasty. This is one of my favorite operations and uh, in my textbook on cosmetic surgery uh, it's one of my favorite chapters. I think this is a, a very special procedure and you know cosmetic surgeons are frequently taking things away i.e. doing facelifts, eyelid surgery, taking wrinkles away with lasers or they're putting things back uh, chin implants, cheek implants, uh, injectable fillers, fat injection. However, uh, one of the really fun things about cosmetic surgery is when you're creating something or sculpting something or making something and this is what is unique about otoplasty. So we're going to talk a little bit today and this uh, um, talk or lecture is aimed uh, for prospective patients. Uh, it's not at the, the level uh, for surgeons but we're going to talk about both uh, diagnosis and surgery and the common procedure. So we're going to zoom in here a little bit and, and follow the screen. One of the things about otoplasty, it's, it's really one of the few procedures, uh, if not the only cosmetic procedure that I perform on children. So it's a delightful group uh, to work with and we're working with young children and watching them mature into adults and again this is kind of why it's one of my more favorite procedures and again it has uh, intangible payoffs um, because protruding ears can affect children. Uh, studies show it can affect their self-esteem for the rest of their life and um, you know they get bullied and teased and uh, when children are appreciative we get some really cute thank yous. So let's talk a little bit uh, about the ear. If you measure a normal ear, it's about 10 millimeters uh, from the temple and there's usually uh, enough space just to get your little finger behind the ear and it's about 15 or 20 millimeters uh, at the lower part of the ear. Uh, and some children have protruding ears and this is somebody tipping their head back just to, just to show this uh, cartilage excess and the fact that these uh, ears are protruded out like a uh, almost wings on an airplane. So this is called promenaris or simply protruding ears and uh, this affects about 5% uh, of the population and occurs in about 1 in uh, 12,000 births and some very famous people that we know have protruding ears. I would love to fix uh, President Obama so uh, if you're watching this Mr. President <laughs> come on down we'll do it for free. Um, and uh, protruding ears, it's a hereditary situation. This little guy, uh, you can see his uh, grandfather, great-grandfather had protruding ears. These are twins with protruding ears and another set of uh, twins. I got that off the internet. That's kind of a scary picture there. Um, now, there are really two main deformities when we're talking about protruding ears. Number one is the lack of the anahelical fold. The anahelical fold is this beautiful sculpted fold that occurs in the normal ear and that is called the anti-helical fold. This is the helix, this is the anti-helix, so it's the anti-helical fold and some patients they don't have that. You can see this is like this looks like a cereal bowl and there's not this type of sculpted anatomy and this is almost like a little peace sign. So if you don't have an anti-helical fold um, that's the probably the most common deformity and the ears stick out because uh, you know, there's, there's no fold there and that anatomy to hold the ears back. So when you look at somebody and you don't see that little piece sign, that nice anahelical fold, that's a common deformity that causes protruding ears. So one of the things about otoplasty operations, this I just did a little Google search on PubMed which is the, uh, the uh, medical journal publications and I just put otoplasty and you can see there's 404 papers on techniques how to do otoplasty so there's always somebody trying to come up with some you know miracle techniques just like facelifts you know that they, they you, no recovery less downtime but really there there is only several truly accepted ways that are safe and are long lasting or permanent and, and you don't have to worry about relapse. So somebody's always trying to put a, a spin on cosmetic surgery but there are a couple time tested procedures and we're going to talk about those. Um, so let's talk a little bit about when do we do otoplasty, okay? So these deformities, uh, these children are frequently uh, bullied 
uh, are made fun of and again it can affect their self-esteem for the rest of their life. So we like to do this before school starts. This is important. 85% of our ear is developed by the age of three. So uh, we've done, I've done this as young as uh, patients that are uh, three years old. You know our average patient is probably five uh, when you're talking about children. I've, I've done it on uh, 60 year olds as well but most of these we're doing on young children, so we want to do it before school starts because the ear is fully developed at seven or eight years of age. And um, again, if you can get these children into school uh, uh, with normal ears, I think it, it makes their uh, life easier and better. So again, four to five is fine, and that's what we're frequently doing. And uh, so good candidates for otoplasty, healthy children with prominent ears, uh, ear cartilage that is stable enough to put sutures in, uh, the, the absence of any significant ear infections because you can't operate on somebody while they have an infection. Uh, you know, it's nice when the children are old enough to cooperate or understand, but frequently they don't. And one of the things that uh, parents want to know is, you know, how, how do you, do you make your child do this? Do you try and reason with them? And, you know, that's an individual thing. Uh, you know, my, many, many children don't want to have orthodontics, but their parents make them do it because they know that they're going to be thankful later in life. So uh, when, when parents ask me, I mean, if it's a, a severe deformity, I recommend that they do it and, you know, whether the child wants to or not. And, you know, sometimes children are very, uh, 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 they're very deep and, you know, they understand. And, and, the, and some children really want to do it because they don't like that. So that's kind of a a whole personal thing and you know sometimes uh, the parent may need to consult a child psychologist but that that's rare most people just come in uh, and we simply do it so we're going to talk about operating on the number one deformity and that is the lack of the antihelical fold and we're going to do a procedure called a mustarde otoplasty okay and um, what we're doing here is we're making an incision in the back of the ear and we're putting these specialized sutures here and what this does is it folds the ear back so if the ear is sticking out it folds it back and creates an antihelical fold so these people don't have antihelical folds and we're going to perform this procedure this is dr jack mustarde and uh yeah, he's no longer living, but he was a, a really talented surgeon, and I wish I uh, could have met this guy because this is an ingenious little procedure that he came up with in the 1950s, and it's probably the most common way we treat protruding ears. And so if you take an ear without an antihelical fold, and let's zoom in on this real well, there's no antihelical fold here. And if you just take your finger and push the ear back towards the um, temple, then the antihelical fold kind of just automatically pops up. So what we're going to do is make some marks and we're going to put some specialized sutures in here from the back of the ear called mustarde sutures and that is going to simply fold the ear back, make a normal antihelical fold and take care of the protruded ears and sometimes people call that uh, pinning the ear back. So what we're doing is we're, we're placing these sutures and there's usually three or four of them and although it sounds really easy there's a lot of technical expertise that goes into this and you have to uh, place them in a, in a very controlled manner because you have to duplicate this very uh, detailed curvature of the antihelical fold and we use a permanent uh, white suture so it doesn't show through the skin on a very small needle and we make a small incision on the back of the ear and you really never see this incision and we remove some skin I either use a radio wave surgery or a laser and there's no bleeding which makes faster uh, healing and this is actually the back of the ear opened up and you can see the ear cartilage and again when we're doing the mustard procedure we're, we're dealing with uh, just the lack of the antihelical fold. This is not a procedure if you have excess cartilage and we're going to talk about that in a minute. So we make these little marks and this is where we're going to uh, place our sutures and um, so these sutures will go in and will weaken the cartilage and when we tie this suture down uh, and this is an actual mustard suture and this is what it would look like if you were looking through the skin. When we tie these sutures down it actually takes the ear and pushes it back. So, the ear, so you have this protruding ear 
with that shallow absent fold and when you put one, two, three, four sutures in, it pushes the ear back towards the head and it recreates that fold. So if, you're, if your only problem is the lack of anahelical fold, then this is the procedure to do. Um, and you can see the ear is protruding. You, you can't even look into the ear uh, because the, the helix is sticking out. And this is before, after, before, after. So there was really no anahelical fold. Now there's a nice curved anahelical fold. <clears throat> now, the second deformity is cartilage excess. So if you look at, this is a normal ear. This is about the distance uh, from the from the temple to the ear, but some patients have this extreme excess of cartilage here, uh, just like it was a, a lemon wedge of extra cartilage, and because of that, it, it pushes their ear forward. And this is, this is called the conchal bowl, and that's conchal bowl excess or excess cartilage. Now, if you try to fix this by putting mustarde sutures in and pulling the ear back, it's gonna fail because the cartilage has a lot of elastic memory and over time that will pull those sutures out. And this is one of the biggest misconceptions and, and I see all the time surgeons trying to treat cartilage excess with the mustard sutures. That won't work. It will relapse and it won't be a lasting repair. When you have excess cartilage, the only way to successfully treat this is to remove some cartilage. And some people will also uh, try to put sutures in the cartilage beside the mustard sutures and, and anchor this to the deep tissues. Again, uh, I've treated numerous cases where somebody tried to fix a problem with excess cartilage without removing cartilage and they try it with sutures and this is where you get relapse. Um, you know, you can't make guarantees, but I can tell you when you take cartilage away, it's impossible for that ear to stick back out. So it's very important that the surgeon and the patient understand the true diagnosis. The mustard sutures are for the anti-helical fold. If you have cartilage excess, which most people do, you have to remove some cartilage. And um, so again, here's another case of normal ear conchal bowl excess, and you can see that that uh, normal cartilage versus the extreme cartilage that has to be reduced. And um, we do this uh, by a procedure, uh, it's called the Davis procedure, and what we're doing is through the same incision that I previously showed you, we're removing this kidney bean shape piece of cartilage, and that's what allows the ear to set back in a normal position because we've taken that cartilage away. And remember, if you try and correct a cartilage problem without taking away cartilage, then you're not going to have a natural or long-lasting result. And you know, it's, this is not to say that there's only one way to do something, but there, there is pretty much universal agreement. Uh, and and uh, if you have excess cartilage, you have to remove some cartilage. So again, we're taking this kidney bean or cashew-shaped amount of cartilage, and, and when we take that out, then the whole ear will, will set back against the temple normally. Um, so again, here is extra cartilage. And to demonstrate this, this is a nemesis basin, okay, which we use in surgery. Uh, but you could do the same thing with a cereal bowl. So it's this tall. So if you could imagine cutting the bottom off the cereal bowl, the cereal bowl would be shorter, all right? And if you took, if you pretended those were the ears, and you took the bottom off of these, the ears would be closer to the head. And these are uh, pictures from my textbook on cosmetic surgery. So we do very precise measurements because we have to leave uh, a normal amount of cartilage and we're gonna take out that kidney bean. And this is what it actually looks like. These are two different cases. Um, and you can see we've actually removed that hyperplastic conchal bowl and that's what's gonna allow the ear to set back. And quite simply, this can't relapse because you've removed the extra cartilage. You've taken the bottom off the cereal bowl. Whereas if you just tried to tighten, if you left that cartilage there and tried to put sutures from here to here, which some people do, it's amazing how over time that cartilage, that elastic, can pull through those sutures. And um, so again, these are just some intraoperative pictures of us making the, the uh, incision in the kidney bean shape 
taking scissors and dissecting and removing this extra cartilage and then we will put the ear back in normal position and we will put a cotton roll in there to uh, stabilize everything and we'll leave that in for uh, about a week and we close this incision it's a very cosmetic incision uh, sometimes we'll put a little rubber band there overnight for to help the drainage now some people have lack of antihelical fold. Some people have excess cartilage. Most cases that we do are a combination of both. So this patient doesn't have an antihelical fold, they don't have an antihelical fold, plus they have excess cartilage. And almost all of the otoplasties we do, that means we're doing the mustarde sutures, plus we're taking away cartilage. So most of the cases we do, we're doing both. And, and I think we have uh, not I think, I know, we have excellent uh, results in terms uh, of not seeing relapse. And I've only had to revise uh, one uh, ear in, in my career, and that was a little guy that was wrestling with his brother and tore, tore his sutures out. And again, I'm, I'm not meaning to say that, that I'm perfect and we never have uh, problems and everybody else is doing it wrong. That's not it at all. I'm just, I've really, really studied this procedure. And uh, uh, as you can see, we do a lot of photographs, a lot of video, and I've just been a student of this procedure and I feel that I understand it. And I think that a lot of surgeons really don't ever understand uh, the concept of what it takes to, to do this correctly. And having said that, there are a lot of great surgeons out there that do wonderful uh, otoplasty surgery. And um, so this is what it looks like the next day. We, we've got some packing in here and you know you see a little bit of black and blue and the post-op dressing is just uh, what we call a mastoid dressing and the patient will wear that only overnight and then they'll wear a, a headband um, maybe for a, a week just to basically to remind them that they've had surgery so when they sleep they don't grab their ear or turn over. And these are some before and afters. This is this is an unusual case where all we had to do was take away cartilage because he had a normal antihelical fold. And you can see that the, the nice thing about it is the results are, are, are virtually immediate and um, the ear was sticking out. Now it's back in a normal position. Uh, poor antihelical fold. Now a nice defined antihelical fold. And these are just before and after pictures of various otoplasty uh, patients. And here's again a combination deformity, no antihelical fold, excess cartilage. This is the post-operative dressing. This is what they wear the next day. And these are patients uh, the day after surgery. So it's, it's not a real painful surgery. And you know, the great thing about it is a lot of women haven't been able to wear their hair up because of their protruding ears, and they'll come in a week later and their hair will be up. So this is what it looks like again, 24 hours uh, after surgery. These are some more before and after pictures. And again, this is just, I think, one of the coolest surgeries that we do. I mean, we did 100 facelifts almost last year and, and you know, probably three or four hundred eyelids and a lot of laser and I love doing all this but this is such a unique procedure the uh, otoplasty and these are just some before and after pictures you can see all of this on my website lovethatface.com and again these beautiful cute little kids and we make them more beautiful and cuter and it's just wonderful our waiting room has uh, a number of thank you notes from these children I love to get those uh, so just more befores and after. And again, here's a patient before, six weeks after, six years after. So there's no relapse. It's a stable procedure because we make the right diagnosis. Um, and again, to see these people mature, before and afters. And uh, uh, this is a little, little girl that we did uh, free of charge because her parents couldn't afford it. Just a beautiful little girl. And this was 24 hours uh, after her surgery. And uh, again, uh, one of my favorite procedures and uh, another little girl uh, that we did from out of town. We, we see a lot of patients from out of town and uh, uh, very cute. And this is, her mother sent this, uh, it's her soccer picture before and uh, after the surgery. So that's what mom and that's what the daughter see. And uh, again, just a really neat little procedure to get these ears back into a normal position. And, uh, you know, some children have 
uh, an extreme amount of protrusion and uh, getting them back really improves their aesthetics and, and boosts their self-confidence. Uh, I teach courses at my surgery center here uh, several times a year, so we have a lot of doctors from around the country and around the world uh, coming in and out to uh, learn and discuss surgery, and I have my textbook, and I also have a DVD series uh, for surgeons on how to do otoplasty and other cosmetic procedures. So uh, I am really a lucky guy because cosmetic surgery is not only uh, my job, but it's my passion. I mean, I love going to work, and I just love even talking about this stuff. You can see much more about otoplasty at lovethatface.com, and if you want to talk to us, um, our phone number is 804-934-FACE. Uh, for lovethatface.com, I'm Dr. Joe Niamh, too. Thank you very much.